G'day, Crosspoint. Thanks for joining us again. Here we are online recording another one of our sermons for our YouTube channel, so thank you for joining us. Uh, Stephen Carl is going to preach for us on Genesis chapter 2. Uh, he's already done Genesis chapter 1. I hope you've seen that. And G Stephen loves the book of Genesis, and he's researched it a lot, so he's the right man to be sharing with us his learning. So first of all, I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 2, and then I'll hand over to Stephen for today's message. So Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work on it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them up to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the air, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That's the word of the Lord, and now we'll hand over to Stephen. Thank you, David. It's an honour and a privilege to bring the message today. Genesis chapter 2. Last week we looked at the six days of creation and also the six stages of evolution. Just recapping quickly, day one, God created light. Day two, God put a firmament or a gap between the waters creating the sky in between. Day three, God created the waters, sorry, gathered the waters, creating seas and dry land, and then he created vegetation. Day four, God created all the heavenly bodies in the universe. Now, if you remember back to that last one, the word universe means a single spoken sentence. Day five, God created the sea creatures and the birds. Day six, God created the land animals and insects, and finally, mankind. At every stage, God called his work good. But when he had finished, he called it very good. Now we pick up at the start of chapter two. 
the first verse declares that the whole of creation is finished. Then God rested from all the work that he had done. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The word Sabbath is used in the Bible over 150 times. God, right at the start of time, established the Sabbath day as a day of rest. Society these days doesn't rest. We're always doing something. How many of us just go home and rest after church on a Sunday afternoon? We are all too busy. And I must admit, I have to stick my hand up for that as well. Who can remember when the shops weren't open on a Sunday? Or who can remember when most people uh, went to church on a Sunday? What about having a Sunday roast after church and inviting people around to share it with you? People don't see Sunday as a holy day anymore. It's just another day off work to play sport, go shopping, work around the house. I would suggest that we need to go back to having it as a day of rest. Verse 4 and 5 then does a quick recap of creation. In the day that the Lord God made the earth, that's day two, and the heavens, day four, it hadn't rained on the earth. Now, I think this is interesting that it mentions this, that no rain had fallen on the earth. After all, the earth was only a few days old. Verse six talks about the mechanism that God put in place to water the earth. It seems that this mechanism was put in place before God had created plants. But after the heavens were made, which seems to contradict what is written in chapter 1. However, what verse 5 is referring to is actually cultivated plants. God had created plants, but man had not cultivated plants yet. Primarily because, well, he hadn't been created then. The plants referring to in Genesis 1 verse 11 and 12 was a very, very general term referring to all types of plants. However, here in verse 5, it is more specific we are talking about crops. In verse 7, we are now given a short description of God creating man. Man was made out of the dust of the earth, and God breathed into him the breath of life. That implied that God created man with no life and then gave him life. Interestingly, God made man from the dust or from the dirt first and then breathed life into him. Everything else up until this stage had been made by God speaking into existence. Now it seems that God takes a little bit more time with mankind. Firstly, forming the man from the earth, then breathing life into him. Now, I find it interesting that God breathes life into man in order to make him come alive, which seems that God didn't do this for the animals, which may mean that God did more than just breathe life into Adam. It's quite possible that at this time, God gave Adam his soul. God then plants a garden for mankind to live in. The Bible says that this garden was planted in the east. Some think that this would refer to the east of where Israel is today. However, the flood would have changed the face of the earth quite dramatically. Noah would have had no idea where he would have landed in relation to where he started from. The best explanation was east of where he first created Adam, 
or east of where mankind lived after they were kicked out of the garden. God planted two types of plants in the garden. The first kind were plants that were pleasing to look at. When you put plants in your garden at home, you generally put plants in that have some sort of function or look good. Up until a year ago, uh, we had potostrums lining our driveway. Well, they were getting woody and old and hard to prune. I decided that they were going to be removed. I was going to rip them out and put new ones in, same species, potostrums. However, Melinda said, hey, let's put bamboo in. That would be a much better plant. So we put bamboo in, and I think it's certainly much better. The photo that you see, um, the plants have grown a lot since then. It looks really good. God wanted mankind to have a pleasant environment, so God put in the garden plants that were pleasing to the eye. God also put in plants that were good for food. Remember last week, God created mankind and animals to only eat plants. God knew what plants were good for food, and he planted them in the Garden of Eden. God also planted two special trees in the garden, the tree of life. This tree was made specifically for mankind to be able to live forever. Chapter 3, verse 22 states, Least he put out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Mankind needed to eat from this tree in order for our physical bodies to remain alive forever. The second tree was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was thought to be more of a symbolic tree. It represented mankind's obedience to God. The reward for being obedient to God was eternal life. Well, mankind broke that law, which meant mankind had to, sac had to make sacrifices of living animals in order to receive forgiveness for our sins. Sin brought death into the world. Then God had to use Jesus as a sacrificial lamb in order to enable us to have eternal life. Verses 10 to 14 talk about a river coming out of the Garden of Eden. This river divides into four rivers, the Fishon, the Gihon, the, the Hirakal, or known as the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Interestingly, the, river, the rivers divide. Now, this doesn't usually happen. Most of the time, it's the rivers actually coming together to form a bigger river. A good example of this, for those of us who live here in Victoria, is the Murray Rivers and the Goulburn Rivers coming together. The Euphrates and the Tigris rivers in modern-day Iraq are not believed to, by some to be the rivers mentioned in the Bible. The rivers run into each other rather than dividing. Or in other words, the water is flowing the wrong way to be the same rivers. The modern-day Euphrates and the Tigris rivers are most likely rivers that were just given the same name. Just like parents sometimes name their children after themselves or after their grandparents or some other relative or a celebrity or someone else that they know because they like the name. In verse 15, God puts man in the Garden of Eden. However, God gave a man a job to do whilst he was in the garden. He was to tend it and to keep it. God had planted this beautiful garden and mankind was to keep it that way. You know, I think that we would still be trying to look after the planet, just like Adam was instructed to look after the Garden of Eden. So God puts Adam in the Garden of Eden, and Adam is told that he can eat of the fruit of any tree in the garden. 
Remember in verse 9, God had only put trees in the garden that were either pleasant to sight or good for food. Then gives Adam the instruction not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, God didn't want robots. He didn't want mankind to be a servant, blindly following God's laws. He wanted us to have the freedom of choice. God could have left out of the garden the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That would have eliminated the possibility of sin. But we see here that God loves us and wants us to be obedient to him. Not because we have to, but because we want to be obedient. God did say to Adam that if you eat of the fruit, you shall die. Most translations say that the day you eat the fruit, you will surely die. The death here is referring to the death of the immortal body, in essence dying and being replaced by a mortal body. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. It was a case here as well. Man was to live an immortal life. But if mankind sinned by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, then death would follow at some stage. So here we have Adam in the Garden of Eden, and there is plenty of food around him, and things are just great. However, God sees an issue. The job of caring for the Garden of Eden is probably, probably going to be a big job, so God decides that Adam needs a helper. Now, we see once again the passage referring to creation, specifically, specifically days 5 and 6, where God created the birds and the animals. God brought the animals and birds to Adam to see if one of them could be a helper, and also for Adam to name them. Now, some people have an issue here with this, as there are so many species of animals on the planet. How could Adam name all of them in one day? Now this was day six and we'd have already had a lot going on. God's created animals, he's created man. He's planted the Garden of Eden for mankind. He's placed Adam in the garden and now Adam needs to name the animals. Well, the Bible is quite clear that Adam was naming all the kinds of animals, not the species. For example, there are about 40 breeds of cats, or 40 species of cats. And of dogs, we're looking at about 450. Now, Adam didn't need to name them all. He just needed to call them cats and dogs. There is believed to be around... 1,500 kinds of animals and birds. Adam could have easily named them all in one day or even a few hours. Now we need to remember God made Adam, which means Adam would have come fully programmed. God didn't need to teach Adam anything. It was highly likely that at that stage Adam was the smartest man on the planet at that time. If you got that joke, he was the only person on the planet at that time. By the end of verse 20, it states that no helper was found for Adam. And I'm fairly sure that God knew that no helper would be found and that he would have to create woman. We see in verse 21 and 22 that God makes a woman. Now, there are two theories as to why God made a woman last. The first is that everything else was just practice and the woman was the only thing he got perfect. And that is why God stopped there. The second is that God made woman last so that he wouldn't have anybody telling him how to do it. 
God puts Adam into a deep sleep and removes one of his ribs in order to create Eve. Question, why did God remove a rib rather than any other bone? Well, when I was younger, there was a theory going around that if you found a skeleton, you could tell if it was a male or female just by counting the amount of ribs that it had. Well, this is not true. Males and females have the same amount of ribs. Why then did God remove a rib and use it to create Eve? And when I heard the answer to this, I thought, how cool is this? Ribs can actually grow back. If someone is involved in an accident and their bone structure is damaged, it is often repaired by removing one of their ribs and using that as a bone graft to repair the damage. Now, if there's a lot of damage, then they can remove the rib, wait for it to grow back, remove it again, and keep repairing the damage. Now, if you go onto the website creation.com and type in the words regenerating ribs, you will see a story by or from Dr. Carl Weiland about his car accident and how the surgeons used his ribs to restructure his damaged bones. Now, after the creation of woman, creation is complete. The world is very good. The animals and mankind live in peace and there is no evil in the world. Too bad it didn't say that way. Let's have a look at the Garden of Eden, what it would have been like, and then I'll finish up. In verse 7 of chapter 1, God separates the waters and creates a firmament above the waters. And I said in the last sermon that that was very important. Verse 20 talks about the birds flying in this firmament. So there was a layer of water above the earth. This would have had three major effects on the earth. It would have increased the air pressure. So breathing would have been a lot easier. It would have given the world a greenhouse type of effect and it would have blocked out the harmful UV rays from the sun. The blocking of the UV light from the sun would have been a major reason why people and animals during that time would have lived to such immense ages. We are constantly being bombarded by UV light, which is causing us to age. Back before the flood, the earth would not have had that problem. Some Christian scientists say that it would have also given a magnifying effect. So the night sky would have been a much, cl much clearer and you could have seen the stars a lot better. We just looked at verse 9 of chapter 2 in which God planted the most desirable plants in the Garden of Eden. Verse 25 states that they were both naked. This would mean that because Adam and Eve didn't need clothes, that the temperature of the garden would have been neither too hot nor too cold. There were all types of animals in the garden. Remember in verse 15, God put Adam in the garden and then in verse 20, brought the, Adams, uh, the animals to Adam to see what he would name them. This would have included dinosaurs. Now you might be thinking, well, there's no mention of dinosaurs in the Bible. There's actually a very good reason for this. See, in 1611, the Bible was translated into English. However, the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. So you couldn't have used a word that was invented in 1841 in a document that was translated over 200 years earlier. Let's have a quick look at Job chapter 40. Uh, verse 15 says, Look at Behemoth, which I created with you. It then goes on to describe this animal. 
Verse 15, it eats grass like an ox. Verse 16, his strength is in his hips and the power is in his stomach muscles. So it has big hips and a big stomach. Verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze and his ribs like bars of iron. We are talking about one very strong animal here. Verse 23, the river may rage, but he is not disturbed. Once again, we are talking about a very strong animal. Now, most Bible commentaries would say that this describes a hippopotamus or an elephant. But if we look at verse 17, it says he moves his tail like a cedar tree. Cedar trees are very large trees. They can grow as tall as 60 metres. Verse 17 describes a very large tail. Hippos and elephants don't have large tails. The only type of animal that fits this description in Job chapter 40 is a sauropod type of dinosaur, like a brontosaurus or a brachiosaurus. There is a lot of evidence that would indicate that humans and dinosaurs lived together, not millions of part, millions of years apart, as some would have us believe. But that's one of those topics I better not get onto. Otherwise, we will be here for a while. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. The last piece of evidence is from science. Amber, that is believed to be from before the flood, has been found with air bubbles in it. Now, when these air bubbles have been analysed, it is found to have contained 50% more oxygen than the air today. Higher pressure, more oxygen, and no UV rays would mean that we would heal a lot faster, be able to run a lot further, work a lot harder, and live a lot longer. God had created the most perfect place with the most perfect environment. There was no death, no animal was killed for food, no human ever needed to have died. The weather was great. Wasn't too cold, wasn't too hot, and there was no rain. God is creating another perfect place for us to live. Heaven. This time, however, we need to have a relationship with God before we can enter. We need to have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and love him with all our heart, our mind, our soul and strength. There are entry requirements into heaven. However, those entry requirements are not based on deeds. They are not based on wealth. They are not based on how good you look or what political party you support. It is simply based on if you genuinely love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. We are not perfect. If we were, we would still be in the Garden of Eden. Let us make sure that when our time comes, that we are going to heaven to be with Jesus Christ and God and all those wonderful Christians who have fallen asleep before us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Heavenly Father, for your creation. Lord, thank you for everything that you've created, the plants, the animals, the fish, the birds. Thank you, Lord, for creating us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus' death and resurrection, that we may have eternal life with you. We pray, Lord, that we will be able to understand that we need you in our lives. We need to love you. And Lord, help us to do the right thing and teach others to do the right thing as well. Amen. Thank you.